Hi everyone and welcome to today's event. We are very privileged to be joined by a respected journalist from the Philippines, Marites Vitug, the editor-at-large at Rappler. Marites, how are you? I'm fine and thank you for this opportunity to, to talk to, your, to you and your audiences. You know, thank you so much for your time. We can only imagine how busy you are. We have PR professionals both from the Philippines and across the Asia Pacific and many parts of the world including here in the United States as far as Europe and even Iceland if you can believe it so oh, thank wow. you so much <laughs> yes um, and we'll we'll get into why that is but I think it has a lot to do with what a dynamic publication Rappler is how just how far the Phil uh, Philippines has come and what a powerhouse it's becoming. So with that, Maritas, can you tell us about yourself and your professional background? Well, I've been a journalist for more than 30 years, so that makes me a bit ancient. I started in print, of course, uh, where almost uh, all the older journalists started. I was also editor of a magazine called Newsbreak. And I also wrote for foreign publications, but mostly my interests are uh, national politics, security, uh, justice, uh, judiciary, and uh, current affairs. So I think you may know that Newsbreak eventually uh, folded up and joined forces with this new uh, website called Rappler that was uh, five years ago. Okay, and that's how you became involved. Yes, yes, and uh, since I'm one of the, I skew the age average in Rappler, it's a very young staff, I'm one of the older ones there, so I'm the editor at large, which means that I participate in planning the stories, especially the in-depth and investigative stories, and I also do investigative reporting as well as I've learned and I've loved, I love now using technology when I do Facebook Live interviews and uh, it's very exciting to be part of this um, pioneering uh, website. Absolutely, pioneering in terms of journalism, technology, so many different things. And according to Alexa.com, Rappler is the 11th most visited site uh, in the Philippines, last time I checked, the 300th most visited in Indonesia and quite popular in the US, Canada and many places which have uh, strong Filipino populations. How did Rappler manage to grow so quickly? Yeah, I think uh, two things there, the vision and the energy and the dynamism of the uh, founders. Uh, I s led by Maria Reza who is our CEO the, and there was this uh, uh, initiative or a pioneering instinct to be ahead of the pack by tapping social media. When Raptor began, it was just a small site on Facebook and it, we used the uh, name move.ph and it was just a start and it was quite limited but then uh, having discovered the potentials of social media then Raptor uh, started and then it has grown into what it is now. But what amazes me is that uh, the team, the team leader seem to know, I mean know the social media dynamics very well as well as the audiences who are using social media. You know, the Philippines is such an interesting territory because it's a very young country age-wise, uh, average age I, I think is what 23, 24, something along those lines and um, from 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 everything I've heard, uh, it's one of the most socially engaged, if not the most socially engaged countries in the world. So it sounds like that approach that you took, plus the, a population that was perfect for it, and more and more getting online every day, created just an ex I don't know a spark, right? You're right, and I think that the confluence of those two factors you said, you know. Uh, just uh, set off Rappler on its path, as if the timing was made for Rappler. <laughs> <laughs> and exactly, you talked about young population, the core audience of Rappler is from 18 to 24 years old, if I recall right. That's the core audience, but of course, 
uh, we have other uh, uh, audiences from higher age range at the higher age range. Absolutely, and it's it's amazing to see a publication like yours come up when most of the other popular publications in the Philippines have been around forever, obviously, in our old television stations and so many other things. And, and you all came up in just a digitally native way. What a beautiful thing. You know, Rappler is, quote unquote, a social news network where stories inspire community engagement and digitally fueled actions for social change, end quote. This is quite unique and special. Can you give us an example or two of Rappler-inspired community engagement? Well, there's one which is a mainstay. It's called Agos. It's a Filipino word, but it means like a, a big onrush, a strong wave, a strong rush. Agos referring to the strong rush of floods, of disasters. So that has been around. And every time there's a disaster, typhoons, for example, Agos is activated on Rappler, and that's where uh, citizens, residents, first responders in areas affected by disaster are able to communicate and say how they're doing, what the weather is like in their area, where uh, they need help. So it's it's been very successful, uh, Agos, uh, which has been around for many years. That is a very useful site. The other one uh, I'd like to share with you is a site called X. It is hosted by Rappler. It's um, where anybody or students, professionals can post their blogs, their articles, their stories. It's x.rappler.com. Uh, we don't um, edit those stories. We just ask people to publish their own works and network with bloggers with similar interests or advocacy. So it's like what you said earlier about a town hall, a town square. In fact, we have noticed that a number of school papers now publish in uh, Platform X because they have suffered from budget cuts and can no longer produce a new their own campus papers. So it's quite an interesting uh, concept, again, uh, pioneered by Rappler. Wow, that's amazing, and I mean, it sounds environmentally friendly, frankly, but, but that sounds <laughs> like, a, <laughs> uh, but you know, it sounds like a, a, a great solution, and obviously, Agos, um, audience members, if you've heard about it, just bring it up in, in the questions and comments, but, but that's, a, you know, Maritas, that's amazing, considering, as, as, as you know, Philippines is one of the hardest hit countries in the world as far as natural yes, disasters. Yes, correct. The, the challenge though to uh, for Rappler is and for other maybe web publications is you know the speed of the internet and that's one issue that the Philippines is struggling with but uh, it's slowly to improve and as well as the reach so that uh, most areas in the country uh, in the near future I think in the next five years will have access to Wi-Fi. And that's, that's one of, of course, Raptor's advocacies, is to have speedy and cheap uh, internet. You know, that's really great to hear because, as, as, as we know, the internet, affordable internet and reasonable internet and, and phone service brings economic opportunity, of course. So that's really great to hear. Um, Rappler has a popular business section covering life, the economy, finance, etc. As we discussed, PR professionals are tuned in from both across Asia Pacific and around the world. What makes a story compelling enough to make your business section at Rappler? Well, I think the business section observes uh, the very uh, well, universal rules in, in journalism, which is the st new story should be relevant, should be timely, and it should be told in a way that people will care for it. Business is not seen as an everyday concern here, so it's important for the business section to address two kinds of audiences, the corporates and the small businesses, so that uh, it's not just meant 
to analyze you know financial losses and how big business is doing but it's also meant to inspire or to uh, enable us people to equip them with ideas to enter into small businesses and as well as medium-sized businesses so there are also stories about you know success successes in, in business so that it doesn't just dwell on numbers and financial statements but has a strong human interest. Okay, that makes sense. So rather than trying to, let's say, to use a U.S. analogy, be the Wall Street Journal, you, or, well, some parts <laughs> of it, where they're just quoting stocks, you're trying to bring a human touch to business stories. Yes, because uh, remember that in the Philippines, um, maybe we have a very few percentage of the country it, belongs to the elite which understands you know, stocks and and makes investments, big investments in blue chip companies or in corporations. So we'd like to address also a bigger audience out there. You are a very respected and seasoned journalist, um, as, as, as you mentioned. Um, can you give us, as, as, as someone who's seen journalism evolve in your country, can you give us an idea of how journalism has progressed. In other words, what did it used to look like and what does it look like now and really where is it heading? Yes, uh, this will really show how old I am. <laughs> <laughs> but I was a journalist when technology was at its most basic. Uh, you know, there was no internet, uh, We only, there were no mobile phones, no uh, we couldn't do research online, so it was quite tough, but we worked very hard. I was a newspaper reporter. I covered politics, and that was during the declining years of martial law in the early 80s. 1983 onwards, I started to do reporting on a very turbulent country, because 1983, uh, a leading opposition figure was uh, killed no when he stepped out of the airplane and anyway that led to a big crisis in the Philippines and at the time the reporting became uh, very uh, active and President Marcos who, who had declared martial law much earlier couldn't stop the flourishing of the mosquito press because we kept buzzing into everyone's ears and also what was called the alternative press. And in 1986, democracy returned to the country, and with that, the press media flourished, and then later, in, in, as the years went by, then we had the technological developments, which enabled a more robust reporting from a democrat, democrat, democratic country like the Philippines. But I think the basics remain the same, which is to be able to make sense of what's happening in the country, whether you use technology, uh, you're in digital news, or you're in print, or you're on TV or radio. Uh, it's still to be accurate, to be faithful as possible in reporting what's happening in the country. But uh, now we have a, we're facing challenging times under the new administration. Uh, there is some intimidation and harassment, but there is no official censorship, unlike during the years of martial law. But what's different now is that a lot of people are online, and so they can express themselves online, and it's very difficult to censor you know, uh, digital news as well as social, what's ha appearing on social media. You mentioned Obviously, now is a different time with the internet being open and everyone having a certain amount of clout. And obviously, an organization like Rappler has much more clout than your average person. But you know, you covered politics in certain calm times and certain very turbulent times. Were were you ever concerned personally for for your safety or anything along those lines? Uh, well, uh, I've been sued for libel a hundred times <laughs> because as editor of a magazine, the, edit the editor-in-chief is always included. Uh, but that's part of the territory and this has given me lots of lessons. 
uh, now, I mean, ever since my first libel case in the late 80s, or I think, or, not, or early 1990s, I've learned to be more careful, and that's always what I've imparted to our reporters. The second thing is, yes, I received uh, a death threat uh, when I did reporting on a controversial um, forestry uh, issue in a province in the Philippines. And but again, the news, my newspaper company was able to deal it with it well. Our policy was always to make any threats, death threats, or intimidation public so that that is the best protection we can get. Uh, today, I ask the younger journalists what kinds of threats they receive, and it's mostly online threats, you know, like uh, curses or a very, uh, or insults. Uh, but I think rarely do they get uh, death threats, although that's happening to a few, but it's online. So I don't know we're still trying to figure out if what's said online is really taken seriously offline. But it's always best to be careful. Absolutely. And technology is a booming sector both in Asia and across the world, of course. Um, and and Rappler in and of itself is very, is, is very te technology and particularly socially driven, which is interesting. So I, I'd like to ask you about your t technology coverage. How does Rappler's um, coverage of technology differ from other outlets? Uh, our technology section has uh, three, I think, areas of uh, focus. First, is developments on internet in the Philippines, as I mentioned earlier, it still uh, it still has is facing problems. The second is our technology section reports actively on social media. Of course, news about what's happening on the, about the platforms, and also our technology section keeps track of uh, stories that go viral on, on stories on technology. And third, which is I think interesting, but I'm not into esports, but video games. Our technology section also does a lot of reporting on video games. Um, these are the priorities because, according to our tech editors, historically this got good engagement and page views. So that's for the Philippine audiences. There are also news audiences um, which are picked up which may be of interest to foreign audiences. But now, mainly, the tech section addresses uh, the Philippine audience. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. Well, that's very interesting, particularly gaming, which, of course, I mean, especially with, with the, the Philippines being as young as it is, it makes perfect sense. And how, how fascinating. Um, the... Maritas, the, the Philippines is home to over 103 million people. Indonesia is home to another 261 million or so, uh, where Rappler, for uh, audience members, where Rappler is very strong in both the Philippines, of course, and now in Indonesia as well. These countries have distinctly different cultures and languages. Can you walk us through how your team uh, goes about effectively covering both territories? Yes. Uh Indonesia and the Philippines, of course, have their own uh, differences, but the similarities on online behavior is what is striking. Uh, number one, both Indonesians and Filipinos are very active on social media. Number two, they love to engage online. And number three, both countries have a huge millennial audience online. So those are the three similarities. Now we go to the differences. Indonesians, um, according to our bureau there, do not like reading long features. They just want you know, short bursts of news. And they consume more video content than Filipinos. So uh, based on these uh, data, the coverage in Indonesia also differs from the coverage in the Philippines. But in Indonesia, Rappler has... Um, writes mostly in Bahasa because, uh, as you know, Indonesians 
are allergic to anything foreign. Unlike the Philippines, uh, we love uh, Western stuff. And But Rockler Indonesia has also some English features because we realize that there's a lot of foreign interest in Indonesia. So the English content in the Indonesian, produced in Rockler Indonesia are mostly the longer pieces, the perspective pieces for the outsiders who want to understand what's happening in this huge country. It's very interesting that one of the points that you made really, really struck me, which is that you, in addition to reporting, um, you know, in, 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 in the native language, you're, you're, there's also some reporting about Indonesia in English for the rest of the world. So does that mean that Rappler sees itself as, I'm, I, well, who is your audience really? Do you see it as Filipinos and Indonesians and possibly some other people around the world? Or how, how do you look at your audience? Yeah, I think uh, Rappler, of course, the main audience of Rappler is uh, Philippine audience. But as we, when we built the, we set up the bureau in Indonesia, we wanted to expand to a Southeast Asian presence to get more people from Southeast Asia. But we realized that in that there's so much interest in Indonesia that um, we had to do long think pieces about the country for even Western audiences. So I think that's uh, a foot on the door to uh, opening the audience of Rappler to uh, a bigger segment of, uh, of the world. <laughs> we start with the Philippines, then we go Southeast Asia, and then hopefully uh, a bigger chunk of the market outside Southeast Asia. You know, that's amazing. And, and as, as you and I briefly talked before the, the webinar, and I've mentioned that you know, I lived in the Philippines for a while, and audience members, for, for those of you who haven't ex explored Rappler in depth yet, in case you haven't, phenomenal, phenomenal, absolutely, I mean, groundbreaking stuff. And, and it's, it's amazing to see that not only is the journalism there, but as you're mentioning, you're also very closely following the data and letting the data lead you to the right conclusions and serve the audiences. What a what a wonderful thing. Um, Rappler is based in the fastest growing region in the world economically, ASEAN, of course, Southeast Asia. Uh, what does in inclusive growth mean to you? Mind this. Yes, uh, when I think about inclusive growth, I, I look, I, I, I envision a Philippines that has a strong middle class. Right now, our middle class is uh, wafer thin. Uh, the gap between the rich and the poor is huge. So to have an inclusive growth means that more people are taken out of poverty and lifted to join the middle class so that we have a stronger base that will be more informed when um, it will be more informed and that can demand for better services that can vote for better leaders you know, for the country. That's really my main uh, understanding of inclusive growth. Plus, I'd, I'd like to add also financial inclusion, meaning that uh, it should make it should enable Filipinos to participate in the financial sector by saving, by depositing in the banks, by being literate about money so that uh, they're able to um, prosper in their small businesses. So that really, those two ideas mainly are what come to my mind about inclusive growth. Okay, and that's that's really great to hear. And uh, at the same time, the the Philippines, like like so many developing countries, while while as you mentioned, there's there's vast disparities. It's it's fascinating looking at the entrepreneurship of people sort of across classes. You know, seeing for example, single single mothers working out of their homes and creating little businesses for themselves on the internet and so on. It's it's a, it's a fascinating social experiment. 
Yes, uh, he, here, yes, that's true. We have a growing crop of what are called social entrepreneurs, and you mentioned one example. <laughs> exactly, only one example. Um, how do you see Rappler evolving over the next five years? Really? Wow, that's a, a difficult question, but <laughs> we, we, we need to we see ourselves as improving and continuously innovating in the way we tell stories. We have to get the attention of our readers, our audiences, uh, because of the thriving competition out there not just uh, among media organizations, but on, on social media. So we hope to innovate continuously on how best to tell a story and remain ahead of the, of the pack. So this will mean constant changes in design, constant rethinking of how to present content, and to remain in touch with our uh, audiences and with our netizens who love to engage uh, Raptor and of course the salespeople they give us continuous feedback and it's very important for editorial to listen also to what sales has to say and we're trying to find out new forms of long-form storytelling that will not um, turn away audiences that will uh, really attract them to the site and as, as one of the editors says to maximize reader experience so the long form is still very much on top of our minds we love doing long form stories and we'd like to improve uh, on how we tell we relate these stories and you tell stories beautifully long form I mean in addition to the articles, the visuals, I don't know who does your graphics, your in-house team is phenomenal and then the infographics and the way you all just take very complex social issues, economic issues, political issues and dissect them, it's, a, it's an incredible social service. Yes, thank you and we keep looking at, our, at other uh, models, for example uh, Reuters, uh, they also do very good uh, graphics and storytelling so we keep learning from others as well that's that's amazing to hear I mean your bar is already high and if it's if it's growing even higher that's that's great um, what does the team look like at Rappler as far as full-time folks part-time freelancers uh, syndication etc well uh, as I said earlier, it's a very young team and we have over a hundred people which includes both uh, report, reportorial staff, editorial staff and technical, technical staff. So that's like to be exact 119 and apart from that our nation section which means uh, which covers most of the Philippines. We have about 70 uh, contributors and stringers combined. So we try as to cover as much as we can of the of the Philippines, you know, because we it is we are not a Manila centric uh, news website. And um, of course we have consultants uh, from time to time who whom we engage to help us improve our design and to also to get feedback on, on technological breakthroughs. Wow, 100, almost 120 yes. people. You guys are I huge. Can't, <laughs> I can't, exactly, we started, how many, 20? So <laughs> when I checked, I said, oh my God. And we had to move to a new office, which is now much, uh, much more spacious. Well, well, congratulations. It sounds well-deserved. Oh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Um, as we've discussed earlier, um, Rappler is very strong on social media, very strong. Why do you think your publication is connecting so well with the target audience? Yeah, I think it's because uh, the team that runs Rappler is, ha has the pulse of the audience. Our social media team, I think, is composed of almost a dozen young people. So they know, they monitor the pulse uh, on Facebook, on Twitter, and 
our reporters as well are very young and we have young sub-editors or desk people and who are cons constantly in touch via social media. Um, as I said earlier, I skew the age average there. So, But I noticed that really all of them are engaged online and they know they know what the market is feeling they know what uh, the market is saying about about traveler and there is of course always um, I think constant or occasional uh, analysis of the data like how many are we reaching for these what is the age range and what are they saying aside from that we also have FGDs focus group discussions to find out more about our audiences. So that's that's why the, the connection remains strong because there's a constant learning uh, about who they are, our audiences are. Well it's it sounds like you and your teammates take your investigative approach to journalism and apply that plus obviously technical uh, staff uh, and, and apply that curiosity to your own data and analytics. Yes, they say they never sleep. <laughs> it's a 24-7 thing. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, with the amount of traffic you have, I, I, I can only imagine. So, uh, in the remaining time that we have, um, we're going to take a few audience questions and audience members. The questions are coming in, but feel free to submit them either via Twitter or right here in GoToWebinar, whichever is easier for you, and we will try to get through as many of these as possible. The first question is a technology question, and this gentleman asks, we are a gaming company in Sweden with quite a few players in across Asia, uh, Indonesia, and both Indonesia and Philippines. Um, I, just to summarize, it's a bit long, but just to summarize, uh, if a company is located elsewhere, but they have significant use cases in the territories that you serve, is that the best way to pitch rather than coming to you with a general story about what is going on elsewhere? Uh you mean to pitch to Rappler that uh, a story idea from this company? Yes. Well, what they're asking is, since you're interested in gaming, would the best I, way yes. to approach Rappler be to provide Filipino statistics? Oh, oh, yes, yes. Uh, in fact, maybe they can get in touch with our uh, tech section, and I can give the names of the person and the ad email address. But of course, they can search it on the website. Absolutely. We have another question here, which is, as Rappler grows, do you ever see Rappler um, going reverse? In other words, going into tr traditional media, television, magazines, any of that? Or will uh, Rappler always be a digital publication? I think Rappler will never... It's not in the plan of Rappler to uh, enter into traditional media business, but in Rappler already you could find uh, video. We have news, uh, news on video. We have um, Facebook Live interviews. That's all video. And initially we had podcasts, but we were not too successful yet. And we will try to redo our podcast. That would be radio. So traditional media broadcast media are now in, in Raptor, but uh, I don't think we're going to do print in any in the near future or in the far future. Fair enough. I no need to go back when you can go forward. We have a question about Rappler's videos. The question is, Rappler has exemplary videos. Um, is there a core team focused on video or is this divided across departments? There is a core team. Uh, which is under production. Yeah, they're very good. They came from TV. Most of them came from television. And the thing is, they work uh, very minim minimum of uh, requirements. Having said that, that there's a core team that does the video. This core team trained reporters to take video using iPhones. 
so that all the major beats, at least the reporters covering the, the beats, are multimedia reporters, which to me is fascinating because I've never done that in my life. Uh, but you could see them now just carrying an iPhone, put it on a tripod, and do an interview. They have a video. and But for the main productions, like uh, we have also sit-down interviews. Uh, sometimes we use the, um, or the uh, traditional camera, but most of the time it's the iPhones. Okay, and I noticed Rappler really has a mix, so you may have politicians, regular folks, Miss Universe, it's a really, <laughs> you, you go far and wide. <laughs> yes, yes, because uh, we get feedback that sometimes uh, that there should be a, a variety of people to talk to. Absolutely, and we have another question, which is, how does traditional media in the Philippines, such as GMA Network, how do your competitors view Rappler? Uh, well, uh, GMA Network and ABS-CBN are the two largest uh, television networks in, in the Philippines. Well, they view Rappler as a competitor in the sense that we do video news. So they think of us as competitor. And also ABS-CBN and GMA have their own news websites. Uh, they're big and they have Aside, their advantage over Rappler is that they have television. They've been ahead of Rappler. They've been there for much longer. But they also see the threat posed by Rappler because of the use of very inexpensive technology and uh, the speed with which Rappler is able to deliver the news. So they see this upstart, uh, which is you know not backed by huge... Um, capital, which is able to do the same things they're doing, and if well, if I may say so myself, sometimes in in a better way. We have another question, which is: there are overseas Filipino workers across the world, particularly in the Middle East. Uh, how does your publication address this audience? Oh yes, we have a, a section devoted to overseas Filipino workers. It's called Balikbayan. Balikbayan in English means uh, returning to the country, someone who returns to the country. So there, that section uh, has contributors um, in places, at least in countries where there's a lot of Filipino workers, so that we're able to connect with them and, and uh, listen to what they have to say and report on what they're doing. In fact, uh, when we had overseas voting for the 2016 elections, Rappler was very active in monitoring how Filipinos voted in these various countries. That's fascinating. And obviously territories like Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates are very different from let's say, the EU and the U.S., where there's probably more permanent migration. Can you maybe tell us about um, any work that Rappler has uh, done or outreach with Filipinos living in the U.S. or Europe? Uh, I think with Filipinos living in the U.S., I don't think we've done really... Uh, effective or some a concrete project or outreach to them. It's really more the workers, the, the migrant workers in like Hong Kong, Singapore, uh, in the Middle East, because they have very pressing concerns and they want to reach um, the government in the Philippines. And if Raptor is able to deliver their messages through news, through videos, then we would be of service to them. Okay, that, that, that makes sense, in other words. Okay, that makes perfect sense. And then we have another question, just following up on the state of the Philippines and whether you think the Philippines will continue to grow economically over the next decade or so. Uh, the Philippines economy uh, has been growing since the last few years of the former administration, meaning from, I think, 2012 to 2016 and today it continues to grow and that's because the current government is continuing the economic policies of the former administration plus 
it's also adding its own initiatives to the program, meaning the, the new government is focused on building infrastructure, roads, bridges, airports, so that uh, this will catch up you know, with other countries in the region. So I think the economy will continue to grow. Uh, hopefully that we're a maturing country now, we're a more mature democracy, so that the noise in the politics does not affect the economy so much. Absolutely, that makes perfect sense. And, <laughs> you know, we're actually out of audience member questions. I think we went through those nicely. As our first, you know, we've had journalists here from the U.S. and Canada and Europe, uh, but you are the first journalist who, who we've had in front of this PR audience, um, you know, from from the Philippines. And, and I, I really want to thank you, Maritas, for number one, your valuable time because you're obviously a very busy person and number two for really educating us about what's going on both with your publication as well as with your country. It's my pleasure and thank you very much for um, inviting us to this uh, panel. It's our pleasure. Have a great afternoon. Okay, thanks. Bye.